Welcome, Professor O'Sullivan. Thank you for your attendance at the ANSCAR SM 2019. Um, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to listen to both of your talks, uh, both yesterday and today. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I was particularly interested to hear that you use the term awake to kill intubation to encompass both uh, awake fibre optic intubation, awake video laryngoscopy and front of neck, neck access. Um, I wonder how you would decide between either awake fibre optic versus awake video laryngoscopy for the management of the patient with an unanticipated difficult airway. And thank you very much um, Claire. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It is a, a wonderful meeting and um, everybody has been, been so friendly. Um, just to answer your question, um, um, we're now using the term awake tracheal intubation because we feel that awake fibre optic is a misnomer because awake tracheal intubation encompasses the other techniques of securing the airway awake, like using a video laryngoscopy uh, awake to secure the airway, um, using a superglottic airway device, and putting it in awake and intubating through it, and also awake front of neck techniques to um, access the trachea. So I would do awake video laryngoscopy in certain circumstances. Obviously you can't do it in the anticipated difficult airway if there is no mouth opening, which is sometimes the case in maxillofacial patients. Um, if patients have abscesses in the airway, um, it may be difficult as well, or tumours in the airway. But for laryngeal pathology, one can use an awake video technique. We tend to use, often use a hyperangulated blade to improve our um, view of the larynx and w w w with a stilette. But it's all about topicalization, um, adequate topicalization of the airway. With the video laryngoscope, you can get a wider angle view sometimes, so, so it facilitates that. And you often can use it in combination as well with, with the fibre optic scope. Thank you so much. So my other question is, um, linking in with today's um, talk that you gave us, um, what do you think was the greatest lesson that was learnt from the NAP4 audit in the, in the UK and Republic of Ireland? Well, I think the um, most immediate um, impact was the effect on capnography availability and use. Um, when NAP4 was published in 2011, um, we know that there were capnographs probably in most operating theatres, but very few intensive care units had capnography, recovery areas, resuscitation areas. Uh, so immediately recommendations came out that uh, this should change, and I think it, it has changed. But the second um, aspect was um, interpretation of the capnograph trace. There were nine cases of esophageal intubation in NAP4, and most of those would have been prevented if there was proper interpretation of the capnograph trace, particularly when the patient has had a cardiac arrest. I think people thought that would mean a flat capnograph trace, but it doesn't. You get an attenuated capnograph trace if the tube is in the uh, correct position. Um, and so we have now launched a campaign in the Royal College of Anaesthetists, a no trace wrong place um, campaign. If you go on the Royal College website, you can see a video by Tim Cook explaining this. Um, the reason it's been done again more recently is because there have been further cases of undetected esophageal intubation leading to mortality, unfortunately, in, in the UK. Thank you, Professor O'Sullivan. Um, thank you very much for attending the ARSM. It's been quite enlightening. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Claire.